Everybody, welcome back. I'm Yumble, and today I want to show you how I approach building a small town in city skylines. In my previous video, we spoke about how to kind of doctor up a map for a more realistic city start compared to what city skylines usually offers. Instead of the end of this six lane highway interchange, what I did is I reduced all of the interchanges down to as small as they needed to be and ultimately started off the city with a, a, a set of two lane roads intersecting in, in like a T intersection, which is a prime spot for a town to form. Um, I've started building on that map and I've been using some mods and some tricks and some um, techniques to kind of build in a way that I don't think city skylines is designed for. But the result is, is really nice, actually. The result is really good. Um, so today we'll probably start building a second area, a second small town on that map. But I want to show you what I do to approach building a small town in city skylines. Everyone, thank you for being here. Let's build a small town. Let me welcome all of you to the town of Lancaster. This is my work in progress town on the map Little River that I covered in the previous video. So this city, this town, as I said, work in progress. Everything is somewhat tentative, but uh, it's coming along pretty nicely in my opinion. Starting with the map, the previous video is about how I took the map Riverlands from the Steam Workshop and I reduced all of the highways down to this sort of two-lane national road situation. So that's from the mass transit pack. So all of the connections are coming off of that using two-lane roads, and I've chosen to implement some uh, turn lanes in places. But yeah, minimal highway network. This type of place would not have a six-lane highway pointed directly at it. Uh, as a typical city skyline city start tends to be. So I, I find that pretty undesirable for this type of build. But I figured this was a good spot to begin because the starting tile happens to be uh, right here. Speaking of starting tiles, I am using the mod 81 tiles. In order to play on a map like this, you really have to have access to, to the entire map going all the way to the edge just in case you need to modify something or increase the size of the highway or something like that for a realistic progression. So 81 tiles is pretty important. Now getting into the town itself, um, what, what exactly is going on here? I'm using big urban roads. I'm using the uh, big urban US roads pack. So nice yellow lines on it, all kinds of good stuff. Certain streets, to go into the assets a little bit, certain streets are going to be pedestrian streets as the post van drives down it. Uh, this is intended to be a pedestrian only street that cars are allowed to share at certain times of day, which happens in real life. Uh, the bollards would be retractable in that case, but I just thought it looked nice. Uh, th this is by Urbanist. Really, really good stuff. You'll notice that it's pretty cohesive in design. That is because none of this is zoned. I'm not using any zoning. Every building is hand placed. So some things that you'll want to accomplish this might be something like Ploppable Rico. Ploppable Rico allows you to go in to find it, grab a, uh, grab a building, like here's one that I've used in a few places, this this good looking brick building here. Uh, it lets you go in and without zoning it, you can place the building and then decorate it yourself. And that's really what I've done here. I placed this building, decorated it myself, decorated the block, hand placed every single building. So not just the police stations, uh, which I've got like this tentative service area here. I've, I've kind of been <laughs> putting buildings off to the side in hopes that they find a place in the layout over time. Uh, but yeah, everything is hand-placed. The unique buildings, the schools, cemeteries, all that kind of normal stuff. But then, like a kind of a downtown commercial district in front of the train station here. Very happy with this. Every building is hand-placed. And then you can take Move It, the mod Move It, and nudge them into place. So the workflow might be place the building and then go, okay, it's pretty close. Maybe I want it on the corner. Put it there, use Move It nudge it around like this building is actually perfect on a corner i'm shocked that i haven't used it on a corner yet because that's really really good uh, let me leave that there for later in fact so the mod that allows you to do the placing of this and have it not disappear is ploppable rico very very crucial i'm also using another mod called realistic population realistic population lets you 
uh, modify the number of households per building. So instead of being a single family, or sometimes the game will take this type of building and put one to maybe 10 families in it. I don't know, there's, there's some wonky numbers, but this is clearly a two household building. Or maybe it's even four, I'm not sure, but I have it set to two right now. You can change that using realistic population if you wanna modify, override the default population numbers. It also adds, um, when a building has multiple floors, it will change how many, in this case, workers, how many jobs are produced by this multi-floor building. Um, I may have modified that myself as well, I'm not sure. Something to that end, this is, this is crucial. This next element is super duper crucial. I wanted to make this a mixed use city. When I say mixed use, I mean uh, taking this building, for example, there's commercial on the ground floor. Thank you, Hot Dog Harold, love you. Uh, there's commercial on the ground floor, so it's employing 24 workers at the flaming ring in each of these buildings. But I also wanted to let apartments happen in the upper floors, or maybe you want offices to happen, I don't know. Whatever you want to happen in the upper floors, you can do, convert any building to mixed use by placing within it, can we see it? There it is. This is a block service block. I've converted it to be 12 households uh, using realistic population, which we just spoke about. Uh, converted it to 12 households and then used move it to nudge it within the door of this building. So residents are allowed to walk into the building as if they live upstairs. This is the best solution to mixed use that I've heard few talk about. I think uh, really prolific players will use this if they're using procedural objects to modify the the triangles of a building, you know, to modify the model. They'll often put a block service inside of the building, but you can get these from the Steam Workshop. Um, I'm using them to just simulate a mixed use building. The deal is you can't you can't have this commercial building be commercial and residential, but in real life it would be. So I'm simulating it by sticking the block service inside, and you'll see I've done that in many places. This building also has a block service inside. But wait, there's more. The inverse of that, I think this one shows it, the inverse of that is I've got a high density 48 households living in the upstairs of this place. Let's just assume that there's 48 apartments somehow. I don't really know where I got that number. Did I invent it? Yeah, I did, I invented it. That seems a bit high, but that's okay. It's a pretty low <laughs> population town, so whatever, let's juice it up. Um, this is the American Main Street by King Leno. I used Ploppable Rico to turn it into a residential building by hitting Add Local, modifying the parameters to be what I want, and then hit Save and Apply Changes. That is how you convert any building. I could have converted it to any type of Rico residential, industrial, commercial office setting here. I chose residential. Great, so there's people living upstairs, but I still want these businesses on the ground floor to be represented. So what I've done there is I stuck block services inside each one of these. So the uh, convenience store is within the door of the building, employing 10 people. Using realistic population, I changed that number to 10, right? So this is a level one thing. Uh, block, but I've converted it to level 10. Uh, sorry, to 10 households. I put one inside of each door. So there's a business with 10 employees. There's a, say, a restaurant with 10 employees, which is kind of maybe undervaluing in some situations. I don't know. The, the numbers can be whatever you want. But I've taken a residential building and put commercial in the bottom. Over here, I took a commercial building and put residential in the bottom. You can do that same thing with offices. Like let's say if this were, if these were offices upstairs, I don't know, I probably put residential in it because we need population, but look, I didn't, I didn't. Awesome, there's nothing in this building. It has 45 people living in the upstairs already. Nah, maybe that's an apartment building. This one, 25 households. Maybe there's a few offices mixed in. Maybe there's offices on the ground floor instead. Let's see, I haven't added a block inside. Cool. So to show that complete workflow, I would go to my Find It mod, open up Offices under Growable. I believe I should have custom blocks here. Yep, Block Services, Offices 1, Offices 2, Offices 3. Let's take Offices 1. We'll start with this. And maybe there are... 
Maybe there are 15 people that work on the office in the ground floor, or maybe they are, they work for the apartment complex. Doesn't really matter. Make up whatever lore you want. This has one worker assigned to it. It's already the correct settings within Rico, so I have not changed anything to make it this. This is from the Steam Workshop. It came this way. It's as if it's a growable office building, as far as the game is concerned, though it doesn't look like it. I'm gonna go to realistic population, override population. I wanna have 15 office employees working for this business in the, on the ground floor, or this uh, working for the residential company, whatever the case may be. Awesome, so now it employs 15 workers, most of which are highly educated. That's how offices generally work in City Skylines. I'm gonna kinda nudge it into position and we're gonna put it behind this door. So I'll use move it to rotate it so that it makes sense. Right in front of the door and boom. Now the office employees who live nearby or maybe even live in the same building get to go downstairs to their, to their office workplace on the ground floor or they can commute from within the city to get to this place. This is to avoid a sprawl situation where normally the game has you zone in an area and zone in, here's the commercial, here's the residential. The two people walk back and forth all day and, and that's cool, except for the fact that you've taken up twice as much space as is necessary. When you should, when buildings like this have people living in them and working in them and shopping in them all at once. I've probably already put a block in here to reflect that. There it is. There are 12 households living in this place. So I strongly recommend checking out this uh, block services method of, uh, of mixed use in City Skylines. I think it's totally underexplored and I would recommend it. And here we are back on Earth. Before I show you how I actually approach doing a road layout and thinking of the history of the city, I want to show you my inspiration for this, um, maybe for this build, at least for the first city. I'm from New Hampshire originally. I went over this in the previous video. And Portsmouth is not my hometown, but it is in a region called New England, which is this, this area here in the Northeast US. We're going to go down to Portsmouth. This is an early American city. It has not really outgrown itself or anything like that. Like, clearly there's a highway bypass going on, just like my map has. But, um... It really hasn't grown into a Boston, or a Salem, or... There's all these other more major... If you zoom out, you can see more major, like, New England cities. Boston would be one of them. Providence would, of course, be one of them. Worcester. All these things. Often named after, uh... Places in the UK. You can imagine who might have settled this, right? So Portsmouth, early U.S. city, it's at the mouth of the port. It's at the, uh, where the ocean kind of has an inlet, or there's a river going to the ocean. Great for shipping. There's all kinds of reason to settle here. A lot like the map Little River that we're building on, right? Formerly Riverlands. It makes a lot of sense. So the road layout that I did is based heavily on this. If you look at what this is, it's a little bigger than my hometown. It's a lot bigger than my hometown of Lancaster, but very, very large. Uh, it's very, as I said, settled by Europeans. So if you look at the ground level and look at the wall-to-wall -wall nature of the buildings, other than the yellow line and uh, probably other elements, this looks like it could be a lot of older places in the world when compared to many US cities. So as I said, early US city. The reason that I chose to emulate early American cities is because I really wanted to to have it be walkable. I wanted it to be uh, walkable with, with car access at the same time, because that's, that's what's happened in many places, including European cities, without overdoing the car access. So bikeable, walkable, shoppable, livable, all these words, all these funny words. Uh, you can see that this is probably apartments upstairs, just like our mixed-use situation. There's a uh, the Portsmouth Brewery. I've never been, but, you know, it exists, with probable apartments or maybe offices upstairs on occasion. I'm not... I can't speak to the uses of all these buildings. But you can imagine walking here would be a bit of a treat because there's limited traffic. This looks like probably a one-way road. They took the small roads and uh, converted them to one-ways. Little pedestrian alleys have been converted. Love the brick sidewalks. 
all these elements. There's a church over here, like just all kinds of classic stuff. Church with a bit of a wider town square type area. But yeah, it's it's uh, relatively safe statistically. It's well kept, good tourism, good vibes. And this is really what I was modeling my my city after. So this is where I found inspiration. Looking from above, we just kind of toured this area here and the church is, I forget, maybe about here. Yep, that's the church. So we, we kind of went around to the church. Um, looking at the road layout, it is a loose grid. So there are areas of, like this is quite gridded, this little set of streets here. A lot of them are virtually rectangles, but I didn't want to sweat the perfection of it. And you can see in later developments, the grid gets a little larger, right? For this residential area, it's still this loose grid, uh, a loose and broken grid in places, but it's much larger because by this time there were probably cars on the scene, I'm guessing. But the city core is very dense, very small grids. Small grids equal walkability. Large grids, not that these aren't evil. These are these are very modest for a for any sort of city. This is not. I'm not hating on this. It's when you get a Kansas City, Missouri. It's when you get a um, all of Utah, like all these places that are that you need a car to get around, are a far cry from this, where you've got little teeny tiny gridded areas, and you can walk from place to place very safely, bike from place to place. Uh, that's that's what I was going for. So I wanted main road access, just like this, there's there's kind of bypasses, this yellow road, this bypass one, roundabouts of course as well. New England has a, a bunch of roundabouts. Uh, people, people like to talk about how the US lacks in roundabouts, and yeah, we're statistically behind, but they are not, uh, <laughs> they are well represented in New England, I promise you that, uh, in many different places. But yeah, so the yellow road is the bypass with plenty of access. This side is Maine. Uh, there's bridges into Maine, of course, Kittery, I believe, this, this area here. Uh, plenty of access from the highway, from Route 95, or Interstate Highway 95. But it ultimately bypasses the old town. So you can see this old road, Lafayette, another key figure in... Uh, U.S. history, right? A lot of this is is named after. And Andrew Jarvis, I have no idea who that is, but someone named Andrew Jarvis was of note, and they, <laughs> they got a road named after them. So Lafayette Road, Route 1, you can see by the thing there, is the old highway. Turns into Middle Street, still Route 1, goes into town, bada boom, you're in town. You could also leave town on, on Maplewood and go back to the highway, but plenty of access coming off the side of that into this area here. I also love this, just to point out more inspiration. We got a, a monument there, there's a memorial, there's a cool little turnaround, there's a turnaround, like a little street that goes to the shore. Love that, very, very cool. Uh, but yeah, this was my main inspiration for this build. Let me show you what it looks like to apply these ideas to a different area of the map of Little River. <laughs> 